The stuff that I'm going to teach this morning is largely coming from a book called Momentum, which is written by a pastor out of Chicago by the name of Colin Smith. And Colin's a pastor at uh, an evangelical free church up in Chicago, has written this book on the Beatitudes that I personally found profound when I read it and, and told in such a way in which my life has changed over the 12 months since, uh, since, you see, you know, since I first picked up the book. Uh, I'll talk more about that at the end. Make sure you know, again, the name of the book and, and, and where you can find it, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. But let me, let me start with a question for, for everyone. Uh, what does it mean to have faith or to believe in Christ? What do those words mean? Trust. Trust. Yeah, I love that word. And, and oddly enough, that's the way the last class started. Uh, trust is a really powerful word, and, and I'm, I'm going to probably stick with that word in a sense that... Uh, Trust is something more than just knowing something to be true, right? Uh, we can tell our kids something, and they may know it's true, but they may not trust us, and they may not wait on, uh, on, on getting what they want until it's good for them. They may, as we do often, want what we want when we want it, right? So trust is a core of faith. We're going to trust that God is who he says he is and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. So more in the back, yeah. Yeah, and to add on to that trust, just to completely turn everything over to him. Yeah. Just, just give it to him, as Pastor Brett was pointing out this morning. Yeah, the hard part about doing a doubleheader here is I don't get to hear Pastor Greg this morning. Uh, but we're, you know, so many times we come out here and my wife says, we'll come out of uh, second service and my wife will say, Robert, Greg, so, so, so brilliantly added on to what you were talking about this morning to where you know, hopefully all this is, is additive and, and in sync. But we're, we're going to talk a lot about this, growing closer to Christ and our dependency on him. And we're going to do that through the Beatitudes. And I think we're going to talk about it in a way in which you haven't heard before. Uh, and, and why that is, I don't know, because in my own research, uh, the Beatitudes have been, uh, have been talked about in a similar way for most of mankind, most of our history, until somewhat the last hundred years. And so as we talk through this, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, not, not so much church history as great leaders in churches past and what they've said on some of these same topics. So let's dive in here. Uh, as we talk about faith and belief in Christ, uh, have, have you ever considered, James, you know, James chapter two is the whole faith without works is dead passage, right? There's some really tough stuff in James two. And in, in, in James two nineteen, he says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Right, so here's this concept of trust all over again. Right, even the demons, Satan knows who God is. He just doesn't trust him to do what he, to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. Satan wants his way. Pride was at the beginning of all sin. Right? Satan wants what he wants, even though he knows God is who he says he is, and he's going to do for us what he said he's going to do. And clearly Satan's not safe, right? It's not just about knowing who God is. It's, there's that trust factor that says, uh, you know, whether, whether you look at um, uh, you know, Acts uh, 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, that whoever believes in him should not perish. John 3, 36, uh, he who believeth the Son hath life, he that believeth not the Son hath not life. Right, and there's that concept of belief all throughout Scripture. And we're going to talk about faith here in a minute, especially as it relates to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, but suffice it to say that as we get started here, faith apart from works is useless. So I went out and I looked up useless at dictionary.com. Right, that great theological tool. Uh, <laughs> so let, let, let me give you a couple examples of faith without works is use, useless, useless, useless. <laughs> as we go through this, faith without works is of no use. Faith without works is not serving the purpose or any purpose. Faith without works is unavailing or futile. Faith without works is without useful qualities. Faith without works is of no practical good. Right, and that's the word that James uses when he's writing James 2.19. Faith without works is useless. Right, so hopefully that means something to someone that, that useless is not a good place to be as it relates to our faith. We want our faith to be meaningful and to be something that draws others nearer to Christ as well. 
So there's also, uh, you know, as, as Mark gets started in his gospel, a guy stands up in the synagogue. It's the first occurrence of demon possession that we see in Scripture. It says, immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the demon knows who Jesus is, right? And acknowledges him as the Holy One of God. And then we get back to Matthew, Matthew's gospel in chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is saying, and hopefully this wakes everyone up, right? Uh, Every one of us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He's acknowledging that people did things in his name. He's not, Jesus is not debating that, right? He said, I never knew you. Yeah. And we see some of his harshest criticism in scripture related to the Pharisees, right? The religious leaders. So clearly you can be religious without having Christ. Make sense? Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And everyone knows that parable in which uh, that house that was built upon the rock of Christ is an example of the life built on the gospel in which it will stand throughout the trials and the turmoils and the storms of life. But let's make no mistake, because I want to make sure that I haven't, haven't scared anyone to thinking that somehow we're talking about faith and work somehow having something to do with each other. They're interrelated but make no mistake that we are saved by grace through faith alone, right? For by Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Very clear, right? Yeah. Right, we all believe that to be true. Does anyone know the next verse off the top of their head? The very next verse, Ephesians 2, 10. <laughs> No, 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 uh, but, but no, but no, that's good, though. I mean, that's but it, it, it helps to illustrate the point that we, we have so focused. I, I'm 60, by the way. So in a long, long life, a long Christian life, I accepted Christ as a savior, as my savior, as, as a child and have developed faith like so many of you over 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 a longer lifetime. Uh, we know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 by heart, and we quote them all the time. For by grace you have been saved through faith, it is a gift of God, lest no one should boast. Right? We can rattle off the top of our head, but the very next verse says, for we are his workmanship. Why were we saved by grace through faith alone? Because we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared forehand that we should walk in them. Right? We weren't saved to sit and relax and enjoy our retirements, right? My retirement's approaching in two years. I have mandatory retirement with the firm that I work in. I always started thinking about this. We're not, we're not created to then enjoy our glory years living out the American dream. That's not a biblical concept at all, right? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And no matter where we find ourselves in life, our mission's not finished as long as we're breathing. And he is using us in, in amazing ways to pour into the lives of one another, and to pour in the lives of a lost world. Right? We can't do that if all we're doing is consuming truth, learning truth, and not doing anything with it. Okay, we were created for much more than that. So Martin Luther said it best. You've heard Greg, uh, Pastor Greg quote this. Uh, for those of you that know J.D. Uh, JD uh, Greer, the outgoing head of the Southern Baptist Convention, he quotes this often. Uh, it's a Martin Luther quote way back from the 1500s. We are saved by grace through faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Right? Throughout Scripture, you see this concept of faith and works working together. They are inseparable. Yet we're going to find out here shortly, you can't have good works without faith occurring first. So let's talk about that. The reality of the Christian life is that many of us get stuck. Right? We... we we get comfortable in our lifestyles, especially here in America, where we largely are without any great physical need, right? We, we, most of us have, have, have uh, enough money to buy food, clothing, shelter, and, and, and a few luxuries and nice to have. So we, most of us are not 
uh, poverty stricken and struggling with the basics of life day to day. Most of us have pretty, pretty good lives. Uh, and, and we end up settling there and settling for what John Piper calls the American dream. You know, we settle for the fact that we've accumulated now that now life is ours to live out, enjoying the things that we've accumulated. But right? it's just such a hollow truth. Uh, and we make little progress towards Christ likeness when we settle into that mode. But God has other plans. He wants to extend to us a lot of blessings that we've not even yet begun to witness. And he does that through the Beatitudes, which show us how we can receive those blessings. And so I hope as we go through the Beatitudes here quickly, uh, you'll explore these things further and they'll take on new meaning to you uh, because they've changed my life and they've helped me to better understand the simple concept that there's not a word in Scripture that's not meaningful. Right? There's not an order in which things occur in Scripture that's not meaningful, and we're going to discuss that one here shortly. Uh, Colin Smith, who wrote this book, Momentum, that I just described, says, When our Lord sits down with his disciples to tell them about life under the blessing of God, he does not begin with a class on doctrine. Okay, so he didn't just start expositing the Old Testament and saying, let's start in Genesis 1.1. He simply describes a person who's poor in spirit. Right, it's what, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. He describes a person who, a person who mourns over his or her sin. He describes a person who meekly submits to the will of God, and then a person who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Right, and that's how, that's how the Beatitudes start. So a simple point of clarification, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again because I want to make sure no one walks away confused. The Beatitudes tell us what a true Christian looks like, not how to become a Christian. You don't become a Christian through works. You become a Christian by accepting God's grace in the free gift he gave us of eternal life through Jesus, his son. He did all the work. It's up for us to just want what he wants. Right? Trust he is who he says he is and to embrace that truth and live out the rest of our lives that way. Uh, Dwight Edwards, who many of you may know, a longtime pastor of Grace Bible Church in uh, College Station, uh, has a reputation of sending more, more kids to Dallas Seminary than any pastor in that seminary's 100-year history. Uh, Dwight says it this way, the ability to do the will of God is the gift of God. Right? In other words, you can't do the will of God if you don't already have the gift of God. So faith has to occur before works. Right? Isaiah 64 talks about our righteousness are as filthy rags. Right? There's nothing we can do apart from Christ that's going to be a good work or to be righteous because we always have motives that aren't about glorifying our Savior. Okay, so with that being said, let's hop, let's hop into the, Beatitude, the Beatitudes and talk a little bit about what, what they mean. And we're going to have some time here for questions, so Feel free to jump in, uh, love, love open dialogue. If, uh, if there's things you want more clarification on or some things you want to talk about a little bit or just color you have that you think the group would be interested in. Uh, Jesus seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened up his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice how these things are somewhat opposite of one another, right? The poor in spirit get the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the Beatitudes, actually, there's actually another verse around persecution that I've, I've chopped off here. I want to make sure it was all readable. But suffice it to say that the Beatitudes end in persecution. And that's very intentional, and we're going to talk about that. Because the Beatitudes are told in a very specific order. How many of you knew that already? I did not a year ago. Anyone? I had one person in the last class know that. But Jesus told the Beatitudes in a very specific order. 
and each flows from the one that went before it. Okay, and this was fascinating to me. It was enlightening to me. It was profound to me. It's something that I've studied a lot in the past year since first stumbling upon this, this truth. Now, the Beatitudes provide a roadmap for how you pursue a blessed life. And again, what a life in Christ looks like, what a life in Christ is supposed to look like. So Charles Spurgeon, which many of you know, or at least familiar with, I guess most of us don't know him, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> Timing. Right? <laughs> Just a bit of timing. Uh, Spurgeon says this, observe carefully and you will see, typo there, you will see that each beatitude rises above those which preceded. There is a great advance from the poor in spirit to the pure in heart to the peacemaker. Not only do the beatitudes rise one above another, but they spring out of one another as if each depended on all that went before. Each growth feeds a higher growth. And the seventh is the product of the other sixth. The stones are laid upon one another. They are the natural sequel and completion to each other, even as were the seven days of the world's first week. It's pretty powerful, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So when you read these seven, and by the way, when we talk about seven Beatitudes, uh, persecution is number eight. And, and there's an intentional reason that's separated. And we're going to talk more about that. But there's a reason these things are told in an order, and it's as much of a reason as you can't have fish in the sea until you have the oceans created, right? right? right. And so we're, we're going to work through that, but, uh, but that concept is, is really unique. Yeah. Robert, as you uh, describe this, I'm thinking that salvation and faith is quantitative, you either are or you aren't. Yeah, binary. Binary, yeah. exactly. And then once that's established, then the Beatitudes are all qualitative. Yeah, yeah, very, 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 very well said. Yeah. yeah, They're all qualitative, and we're going to talk. You're never going to be perfect at any of them this side right. of heaven, right? Right. Yeah, so, something else to add? No. Oh, all good? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, it is really well said that uh, uh, salvation is binary. You either are or you're not. There are no varying degrees. Yeah, right. Right. And then beyond that, all these other things are things that we're going to spiritually mature in over the course of our lifetime. And as a great pastor said, and I wish I could recall which one, but, but made the statement, the more spiritually mature you become, the more you realize how little progress you've made. Yeah. Right? The more you know about God, the more you realize how broken you are. It's hard to say that and not, not realize how great God's grace is. Well, in a secular sense, the more knowledge you have, the more you realize you need more knowledge. Yeah, exactly right. right. The more you realize how little knowledge you have and how much more you need right. and where that knowledge comes from. Anyone know Martin Lloyd-Jones? You know, great uh, pastor, early 1900s. Uh, there is, beyond any question, a very definite order in these Beatitudes. Our Lord does not place them in their respective positions haphazardly or accidentally. There is what we may describe as a spiritual, logical sequence to be found here. Okay, so if you guys will give me a few more minutes, I'll uh, talk through some of that and uh, ho hopefully convince you that uh, there's more work to be done here and a topic that uh, you dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, Colin Smith, who wrote this book, uh, Momentum, he breaks down the Beatitudes into three sections, and he calls them the roots, the shoot, and the fruits. And so we're going to talk about that specifically. And let's, uh, let's again have some open dialogue here uh, where you'd like, uh, but the roots deal with our needs. We are poor in spirit because we cannot live as God commands. Okay, and poor in spirit is step one. It is binary. We are poor in spirit. When we become poor in spirit, that is how we ultimately know we need a Savior and we embrace God's free gift of eternal life. And you've either done that or you've not. And that's where it starts. Because if you, if you haven't done that, and you haven't, and Christ is not your Savior, and you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, the others aren't going to make any sense. Right? You're going to resist. 
You're not going to make progress. And again, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. But it starts there with the one that's binary. And then we begin mourning, not in the traditional sense that many of us were taught, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. This is not about mourning the death of a friend. It's about mourning over sin. It's about realizing that, that sin damages relationship. It damages first our relationship with God our Father in such a way that we're, we're not able to perfectly live out the Great Commission, right? And then it damages our ability to effectively witness and carry on life with others. Has anyone ever said something that hurt someone's feelings? <clears throat> or has anyone done something in which, yeah, every hand, right? <laughs> yeah, both hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Uh, or done something in your life that, that through an action has communicated something that our God's not, that someone saw something in us that, wow, that guy's hypocritical, right? We've all been there, right? And the more we know about our sin, the more we mourn over sin, the more we come to the realization that, that sin is not acceptable, right? The more we'll be comforted. And I always say, yeah, he was just saying, telling the last class, I don't feel like I have any big sin in my life in a sense of... Uh, I'm not cheating on my wife. I haven't killed anyone lately, <laughs> right? But the little sin in my life is, is a big deal, right? All sin is a big deal. And, and oftentimes we think better of ourselves because we haven't committed adultery or we haven't murdered or we haven't, you know, you, you name the big, big outward sin that's there for all the world, but, but it all starts with pride and selfishness. And, and I've got that. I'll always have that, this side of heaven, as will, as will everyone else. And really learning where that is in our lives and learning to deal with that and learning to mourn over that and, and, and realize that's not acceptable is a stepping stone before we get to the next level. <clears throat> right, and that next level is ultimately giving up our self-will and becoming meek in our dependence on God. And so we spent a lot of time discussing this last class. What is, what is that word? Does that word meek have negative connotations to you guys? Yeah. Right? I mean, in this world, we, you know, meekness is, is, is weakness, yeah. right? But meekness is not weakness, and I'll come back to that. But what, what else? What, uh, what does that word meek, meek mean to you? Jesus was meek. Humble. Putting others Humble. first. Humble. Putting others first. Humility. Gentleness. Yeah, gentleness. Yeah. <clears throat> Strength under control. Strength under control. Yeah, that's a big one, right? Because when I've got it and I choose not to use it and I choose to humbly submit to submit to God, right? Pastor Greg talks about sin. Yes. In need of a power greater than myself. Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in need of a power greater than me. Right? Pastor Greg talks about the root of sin being I want what I want. Anybody finish that? When I want it, right? You hear that from Pastor Greg all the time. And, and meekness is wanting what God wants when he wants it. And being patient, being kind, being humble, being having power under control to say, even though I could take that right now, God tells me that's not good for me. And he tells me his plan is better. And that by waiting on him, he's going to give me per perfect peace, perfect joy in every situation. I go back to Dwight Edwards again. Dwight talks about anytime you're faced with sin, trade up, right? Take your thought, take what you want and trade up for what God wants, right? Trade up. His way is perfect. What he's got planned for us is so much better than anything we could ever imagine. But we often don't trade up. You, know, you go, you go buy a car and someone tells you, okay, you're here to buy a Volkswagen, but hey, for the same price, we'll give you the high-end BMW. <laughs> Who's not going to take the high-end BMW, right? I'll take it. Right? But, but with God, he offers us some, something far greater than a high-end BMW. <clears throat> and many times, if not most, we say, I don't want it. I want what I want when I want it. Right? I, I, I'm not meek. I take what I can get because I can get it. A friend of mine told me years ago when we were raising our kids who are all out of the house now, a friend told me that just because we can doesn't mean we should. Yep. And that was a lesson we taught our kids all through their childhood, but it still applies. Mm -hmm. right? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, and we're faced with that often. And, and oftentimes we've got to stop and say, you know what? This would be really easy to go out and get that. Sometimes it's in our own privacy where no one else would see as it relates to sin. 
somewhat, it's just in public. Uh, be a great example early, early, earlier this week, uh, in which my wife called me and says, hey, I ordered this bag from Target. And they sent me two of them instead of one. What should I do? Take it back. Right? And I said, I think you know what you should do, right? <laughs> and, and so we, we kind of laughed about it. Yeah, you know, it's so easy just to keep it. Nobody would know, right? But our, our Heavenly Father knows. And, and what, whether we believe it or not, sin, even private sin like that, damages us in ways in which we will not really understand until we get to heaven someday. And so she takes it back to Target, she returns it, and they say, you know what, we don't know what to do with this. <laughs> you keep it. <laughs> true, true story, you keep it. And so she, she, was so she was so happy that God had given her immediate answer, <clears throat> an, an answer to doing the right thing, if that makes sense. And he doesn't always do that. Sometimes it's Paul on the road to Damascus, right, in which, Paul, you're not getting away from me. Quit persecuting my people. I am who I say I am. Believe in me. Other times it's a friend pouring into your life, right? Other times it's a spouse calling you out on something in your life that needs, needs fixing, right? And where we trade up and we embrace who Christ is, we start demonstrating that meekness, right? Those are the roots, right? Those are things that we can do. Those are things that are our needs and how God's telling us those needs need to be satisfied, those roots then produce a major shoot that when you start recognizing your needs and you, you recognize your poverty of spirit, you begin mourning over sin and you, you begin constraining your power into meekness. You then start hungering and thirsting for righteousness, right? Because now you're wanting what God wants. And as we hunger and we thirst for righteousness, all sorts of good things start to happen. But that's the one that really springs us. It's the shoot, as Colin Smith describes, to the other three that are fruits. Right? When we start hungry and thirsting for righteousness, we start showing mercy. We stop holding our friends accountable for sin that's no greater than our, our sin. It's, it's the log in our eyes versus a speck in theirs. We start realizing God's extended to us significant grace in dealing with sin after sin after sin after sin in our lives, and yet here we are, we're still here, he's still working on us. And we don't often show that same grace to others. Right, so being merciful is our ability to take what God's given us and give it to others, which is, uh, which is mercy and forgiveness. Purity of heart, talk about one that we're not going to get to this side of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, I don't know about you guys. My heart's still pretty dark. My heart's a lot like David's. I see things I want it. <clears throat> right? Through God's grace, I've learned to control a lot of that desire, but, but a, lot, a lot of desire still comes in from time to time. In a business meeting, it's pretty easy not to tell the whole truth in order to close a deal, as an example. <clears throat> right? God says, trust me. Tell the truth. I'll take care of you. Right? Purity of heart, thinking like God thinks and not thinking like we think. And I think when we get to heaven someday, we could live to be 120 years old. And I think when we get to, and, and be, be, by the way, Billy Graham plus for, for cho choosing just someone that uh, I think we all probably look up to as, as being, being a mature believer. But we're going to get to heaven and Billy Graham's going to find out <clears throat> he didn't remotely understand the nature of his sin. And we're going to find the same thing, that no matter how well we start understanding sin and its effect on our lives, it has far more effect than any of us can ever possibly imagine. And we'll find that out one day when we face a holy God. Right? Just the little thoughts along the way, the little things we do that, that are filled with some sort of self-service. I always say, you know, Scripture's pretty easy. Jesus told us to love God. Right, love, love the Lord God, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. All throughout Scripture is this concept of dying to self. You flip it upside down, that's sin, putting self first. Wanting what we want when we want it. Right, it's that pride. Uh, and then it's you know, putting others second. You, know, you see that a lot in the world where people put other people first. There are some good people out there that are unbelievers, that are doing things to help others, but they're not glorifying God in the process. Right, and so therefore it's not righteousness. 
and then God ends up at the bottom uh, of the unbelieving chain anyway. Right, so blessed are the, the pure in heart. And then, and then when you become pure in heart, you start thinking about things more like God thinks about them. You then can start making peace. And you then can live your life in such a way in which relationships are restored and not, not divided. Someone asked earlier, what about you know, Jesus and the money changers? Making peace doesn't always mean being kind. Right? There are times, such as heresy, in which you have to stand up against it, right ways and wrong ways. My advice there, though, is that many times in my own life where I thought I was standing up for Christ, and it may have initially been standing up for Christ, it can then become more of a debate that I want to win more than I want to glorify Christ. Right, And we can oftentimes... Sometimes, again, enter with, with holy purpose of wanting what God wants. And, 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 and then it evolves into something that's, that becomes sinful in nature. So always be careful there when, you're, when, when, when we use examples like the money changers. Always be certain that what you're trying to do in that process when you're not making peace is defending a righteous and holy God. Right, And in our sinful nature, that can be hard to do at times. Right, but those are the fruits. When we, uh, when we do those first four well, we start doing these next three well, level by level, right? Beatitude by beatitude. And guess what your reward is when you start bearing great fruit? Kingdom of heaven. Anyone want to guess? Double. Kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven? Joy. Yep, yep. You certainly get kingdom of heaven. You get joy. But there's something else Jesus promises you is going to come. Trouble. Trouble is going to come, right? So when you do all these things real well in this world, in spite of the fact we know we're going to spend our eternity in this world, you will be persecuted. The world hated me. It's going to hate you, right? If you think you can lead people to Christ by, by being perfect in this world, Jesus was perfect in this world, right? He led people to Christ, but there were still those that crucified him. Right? No matter how spiritually mature you become, no matter how dedicated to Christ you become, no matter how, how much you're in, in the world preaching the good news, it's not always going to be rosy. Right? Persecution will come just as it did for Jesus. And so if you want to wonder for a few minutes why, why persecution isn't in your life today, if you're like me, I'm pretty comfortable. You know, I've made more money in my career than I thought I'd make. I've got a much better wife, much better kids than I ever thought I would have, right? All my, you know, my food, clothing, shelter, that's all taken care of, right? I'm largely not persecuted, um, and it always goes back to I'm not doing the first seven with total obedience and with total perfection. I never will this side of heaven, right? But the more so I'm committed for Christ, the more I do those things, the more persecution is going to find me. We laugh, those of us that are in the corporate world, it's not a laughing matter, but, but we at times laugh that we have these HR departments that tell you what you can say and what you can't say. And you say that, you're fired. Right? Most of us conform. Right? Most of us are, are not willing to say something intentionally that we know is going to result in our termination. Again, those are, those are hard, hard truths. But God is who he says he is. We're to always live for Christ. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we go look for trouble, but I am suggesting the fact that trouble doesn't find us is something we all ought to uh, think internally in terms of, of, does my life look like Christ? Because when Christ's life looked like Christ, he had a different result than what I have. Is that fair? Any thoughts there? Yeah. Well, the Bible clearly teaches that if everyone is your friend, you have no moral standing. You have no moral standards. Yeah. You're wrong. You're going to have enemies, not just detractors, not people that don't like you on social media. You'll have enemies. And even within your own family, it says, brother against sister and so on, if you stand up for the Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more, the more you stand up, the more, more it comes. 
And by the way, God, God protects us, right? God, God always has our back. He never allows us to be tempted beyond that which we're able. Um, he's always there with us. Uh, some of us, I, I'm convinced, some of the reasons certain temptations haven't been in my life, the reason certain persecution hasn't been in my life is God knows I'm not able for certain of those things. And he, he protects me from those things. Yeah. And he protects you. And he allows each of us to walk within that which He's working at whatever stage we are in our own own walk with him. But he'll never abandon us. Didn't, he didn't abandon, us, abandon Christ on the cross. He knew Christ would go to his death. He knew. Jesus prayed, not, not, not my will, but yours be done, right? Lord, spare me. God, my Father, spare me from this moment, but not my will, but yours be done. And God knew he'd follow through. And God knew that was a story he wanted to tell to humanity. Our story is different. He doesn't call most of us to be crucified but persecution will come along the way. So all these things are additive. Uh, oh, a really important point here. Uh, what's different about persecution than the other seven? The first seven... It's outward to you. Yeah. To you. <clears throat> yeah, said it in a little bit different way. We pursue the first seven. The eighth pursues us. Yeah. Right? Persecution pursues us. And the more we pursue those first seven, the more persecution pursues us. Right? So, clear message here. Don't go out seeking persecution. Seek to glorify God. Persecution will find you. Yes? Um, I just wanted to say this. But um, a friend of mine once said someone thought, she thought someone was persecuting her. She was witnessing and someone was and someone persecuted me and said they told me to be quiet they told me to talk with one spirit and someone came up to her about 10 minutes later and said they weren't persecuting you you were being a jerk there's there's a way to do things that you know she she was telling the truth but being a jerk while doing it yeah um, there are times when we think we're being persecuted and really we, our hearts are in the wrong place we're doing the right thing the wrong way. Absolutely right. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. Really important point. Uh, uh, there are right ways and wrong ways to go about doing things. You can be persecuted for your own foolishness yeah. when the reality is you're, you're making a fool of God uh, and you're being persecuted. You may, find, you may think that's persecution, but the reality is you're reaping the sin in your own heart, even where your motives are right, where, where you're speaking things that are not scriptural, speaking things uh, that are not out of love, etc. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. yeah all, all, always be mindful there. Telling the truth. Absolutely right. And at times we deserve that, right? And at times God lets us have that as a wake-up call. Hey, got to be different. I, th I think about things all the time. You know, you know, there's some atrocious sins in the world, if you will, abortion, uh, homosexuality, uh, murder. You throw, out, you throw out all the things that, that God has taught us are sin, but it doesn't do you any good to yell and scream at the sinner. You've got to get them to Christ, right? Because it's, at the end of the day, it, by the way, I think it's really important that we don't, allow, that we don't kill babies, uh, make no mistake. But at the end of the day, what's far more important is that a heart's led to Christ and that heart decides not to abort a baby than it is a law that has nothing to do with, with <laughs> spirituality in, in one spiritual state, forcing someone not to, if that makes sense. I hope I said that clearly, but we're, we're always better going after the heart. Christ can change the world. Laws can't really change hearts, right. though they are necessary. To, it is important that we protect people from not being murdered, uh, both, both the unborn and, and, and the born. Yeah. That's what, what, what the pastor said. He said, we're in a battle over hearts. Yeah. We're not in a battle over all the different things that look like war. That's, that's it. And, and it yeah, we're in a battle of hearts. And at times we can be guilty of battling the sin itself. And coming across to an unbelieving world is you're just out of touch. <laughs> my body, my choice. Right? Mm -hmm. So in our, in our witness, even where we're lobbying, for example, for laws to be passed, we've always got to stay focused on the heart and the bigger picture of drawing people to Christ, not just about changing laws, which are more 
but not even ends to a mean. I don't know that a loss ever led someone to Christ, um, though perhaps perhaps it has somewhere along the way. <clears throat> other other thoughts? Yeah. I think it's so critical this new heartbeat bill that just passed. Yeah. That is the heartbeat. Yeah. You know, and it's so critical. And I'm thankful for it. We really need to be in prayer. Yeah, me too. Because I think that is God's heart. We Absolutely. Know it's God's heart. You know it's God's heart. You know it's God's will that babies aren't aren't uh, aren't slaughtered as they have been in this country for a long time. Uh, and again, I think those things are really important. But in doing so, there's a person behind those abortions, right? Let's not lose sight of that. Is is the key message there? Uh, let's get to those people and have as much passion for changing hearts as we do for changing laws. They're not mutually exclusive, in other words, right? Um, we can fight for both. Well, in this political arena, it's pretty evident you can't legislate people's hearts. Right. Isn't that the truth? So yeah, when this... they see that heartbeat at six weeks, yeah. that makes an impact. They can see. Amen. Hear. Amen. That's, we need to really be praying for that. We do. That bill to stay intact and not be struck down. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome when we see encouraging signs, God, God being at work through politicians in a day and age in which uh, oftentimes we see the opposite, right? That politicians devoid of God and devoid of, well, just flat, flat out uh, denying God and going about doing things their way without any consideration for, for who he is and uh, ultimate accountability. The point you made is the same. Their, their, their uh, heart and soul is as valuable to God as anybody. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you. What you made too is good because we need to pray for them. Let God do His work in their lives too. Yeah, as, as, as I saw, as I saw someone recently say, uh, even the liberals need Christ. Yeah. Does that make sense? And and so we, so so you know, we need to be really careful in the political spectrum that we're not losing sight of Christ and turning people off of Christ by being all in on certain political positions. Yeah, the Christian realm, there should be Makes no sense. labels. You know, yeah, there should be no la no labels. Uh, God is after Republicans, Democrats alike, conservatives, liberals alike. We are all lost souls. And I think what we're going to find, by the way, is, is that uh, neither party is perfect, neither party is aligned with God, and many times both parties' incentives and motives are, are way off base in terms of what, what God wants out of individual hearts. So other thoughts? That's the Beatitudes in a nutshell. I hope that what you've heard this morning will, will encourage you a little bit to go out and dig in a little bit deeper. Uh, but th there are a few sources that, that, that I use. Uh, the, the, one, the one that I'd really love for everybody, this book, to go, uh, go out and buy Amazon carries momentum. Again, it's a book by uh, Colin Smith, a pastor out of uh, Chicago suburbs. Uh, it really is told well. Uh, most of what I've quoted here this morning comes from this book. Uh, he pulls it together nicely. He's done a lot of research and pulling all these various topics together. Uh, he's biblically sound. Uh, like any, any human author, you may not agree with everything he says, but it's going to enlighten you as to the beauty of the Beatitudes and allow you to build on a concept that I think is, is new for, for most of us this morning of how these Beatitudes build on, one, on top of one another and give us a clear pathway to pursuing the blessed life. Uh, I like Martin Lloyd-Jones a lot. Uh, his his uh, Studies and Sermon on the Mount uh, is a great reference tool that I use quite a bit for, for uh, uh, teaching anywhere in the Sermon on the Mount. This is obviously the Beatitudes at the start of the sermon. Uh, and then I use a lot of different commentaries. Uh, there are a lot of great ones out there that that uh, are worth digging into. Again, anytime you read something in a book, it's not God's Word. I need to go to God's Word and understand what God says. Uh, make sure that what I'm reading is, is indeed the truth. The guys that we all love, we're all fallible, and we can say things at times that don't perfectly align with the truth. So do your homework uh, on anything you read, but uh, momentum, uh, I don't know Colin Smith, uh, but it's a it's a great read. It was it was literally profound. It's 150 pages. It's not not a not a thick book, but what's in those 150 pages? One chapter per beatitude. You can knock it out in a week. Uh, it's profound, and um, my guess is it'll 
it'll uh, encourage you and inspire you in ways that you hadn't uh, hadn't previously known. Uh, you don't need to know who's teaching next week because uh, you guys will be back to your own schedule. But that, that's that's all I had this morning. Uh, maybe just in closing out that topic, uh, I, I found where where I'm really weak and where I'm getting better and working really hard is waking up every day missionally for Christ. And I'm embarrassed at the number of days that have passed in my career where I haven't thought leaving the house every morning, how is God going to work on me today? And seeing every relationship, every interaction I have throughout the day as part of my testimony and part of my my mission for Christ. And that's something that I still, I, I, I deliberately have to think that through every day in order to be prepared for the day. So the message there is as you get it, as you get into those situations, be prepared, right? Recognize it when it's there and be prepared to, to serve Christ uh, in, in the moment. Uh, and if you're not prepared, you typically will not recognize it or not be prepared to, uh, you know, to take it, take it in the right direction once, once it does occur. Appreciate everyone uh, having me. I'd love to do this again sometime. You guys have taught me a ton this morning. So thank you. Th thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>